Okay, class lecture number two. Hey, hard to believe. At the end of this lecture, we'll be one thirteenth uh, being completed with this class. Time is surely passing by fast here. All right, here, folks. Uh, last time we were together, we talked about early man. I mentioned to you about some of the cave painting. Always fun to see those cave paintings. I guess in some primitive way, some individuals in our society still do that by themselves. A can of cry line, go into a cave, and just uh, mark, make their mark there. All right, we also talked about the uh, end of the ice age. I mentioned to you about food gatherers. And these food gatherers who were nomadic, and they were foragers, scavengers, if you will. Then we're going to see a big transition to take place in human civilization, Western civilization, where we see uh, domestication of animals to take place, agriculture, you know, and people become food producers. It was a big, big change there. And towards the end of the class period, we talked about the uh, villages. Villages which developed in towns, which developed into cities. All right, uh, weapons, uh, weapons production, uh, tool production here. And then closing parts of the class period, I believe I mentioned to you about that, uh, the denomination if you will, the establishment of a hierarchy in these various civilizations. We we'll start out the top with administrators, then you have the priests, if you will, the religious leaders, and then what you folks are, the peasants, the workers here, myself included with that. All right, we're going to move into a different topic today. It's a good topic, one of my favorite ones anyway. It's going to deal with Mesopotamian civilization. So let's go to our documents camera here. You should take some notes on this now, and we'll move on into this. And let me get my lighting adjusted properly. And uh, spell the word, if you will, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamian civilization. I'll translate it for you in just a jiffy here. Well, let me go ahead and begin this section by telling you around the year 3200 BCE in a place which is called Sumer, and that's the way it's pronounced here, the earliest form of writing was produced. I'll tell you what that writing is at a later time. And now, for the very first time, History can be recorded. And that's hard for me to even imagine here that we've had written history for literally a little bit over 5,000 years. What happened prior to that? We just don't know. We honestly don't know. So the area I'm going to be talking about is an area which is pronounced Mesopotamia. Now, if you look at the words here, Mesopotamia, and if we look at the word here, Potamia, which means river. So if we put it all together here, this is a land between the rivers. And we think about our own country here, near Washington, D.C., in the District of Columbia, of course, and separating that from Virginia, D.C., from Virginia, is the Potomac River. See what the name translates to mean? Potomac is Potomia. All it translates to mean is river. That's it. And the two rivers we're talking about are the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And I want you to remember that the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Now, the area in question here is the area where Iran is located. So I want you to think about this in the Persian Gulf. If you're following your textbook in the current edition, I'm on page 6. So let's see if I can get this adjusted properly for you good people here. All right, so let's get ourselves oriented here. Here's the uh, Persian Gulf here. And again, I'm working upside down, so I apologize for that. That is the Persian Gulf there. And you can see up here, this is the Mediterranean, which is present here, the Red Sea that's present here. And the area we're talking about in Mesopotamia is this area, which is here. It's about as large as the state of Massachusetts. Today, if we looked at this, this would be the area of Iraq. And then this would be the area of Iran there. Okay, so you kind of get an idea. And if you look closely at this, you can see where the Tigris River is, which is present over here. I don't know if that's in focus for you. And we can see the Euphrates River, which is over there. All right, so I'll move my uh, book here, get that out of your way. And let's see where we are here. And I think I moved something here. So that's why the area that we're talking about. I lost your little slide here, so I'm going to have to... Uh, uh, go back and pick that up. I don't know where I'm at. Uh, here it is. Down here on the floor. I apologize for that. Not a very good way to get started with this lecture. All right. So the land between the rivers here. Notice the Tigris is on the eastern part and the Euphrates, which is on the western part. And what this constitutes, this makes up what is known as the Fertile Crescent. Now I want to show you what the Fertile Crescent looks like. This is in your textbook on page 11. Uh, here is the Fertile Crescent. Here, if we go down to the Persian Gulf, which is present right here, and the Fertile Crescent, which follows the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. You don't want to look at my finger here, so the Tigris and Euphrates River. And it runs all the way over to uh, where the Dead Sea is, you know, and a very, very fertile area. And unfortunately, the areas that are surrounding the Fertile Crescent are not. It is largely just 
desert. So, shall we move right along? All right, now the Sumerian era is the years which is 3200 BCE to 2000 BCE. And for the first 900 years, there was no unified government whatsoever. And uh, uh, the cities actually existed as just independent cities here. And some of those cities which uh, have been identified, cities which are known as Uruk, uh, Ur, Ubiad, we had Lagish, Eridu, Kish, Akkad, Nippur, and Asur. Let me see if I can find this. And I think I saw a map not too uh, long ago, in fact, a few minutes ago, that recognized where those cities are. Now, this is uh, down here is the Persian Gulf where my fingertip is. And if you look at this, I don't know if you can read these from where you are. You can see the location there. Uh, most of these are just uh, ruins in the desert today. Uh, but you can see there, I can uh, recognize Lagash and uh, Nippur, Kish, uh, Iraq, or Ur, uh, and so forth with that too. So that kind of gives you an idea of where those cities were. All right, but so some things are going to change here. And let me change the slides here. And this will take place around the year 2335. BCE, 2335 BCE, in which Sumer was conquered by another, uh, shall we say, semi-empire, small empire, which we know as Akkad. Akkad. You see how it's spelled there, A-K-K-A-D? And this is done so by an individual by the name of Sargon. Now, you need to recognize that name here. Put a little double asterisk by the name Sargon. Recognized as the true king, uh, sometimes referred to as the first empire builder. And for Sargon, Sargon participated in 34 battles and won those battles and he reigned for 36 years. Often referred to as the mighty god of Akkad. Sometimes referred to as the king of the four quarters. All right, might want to note that a little bit. And if you look at this, you can see a likeness there. Uh, uh, what most uh, experts in Western civilization will tell you is actually Sargon. And that is a Sumerian dagger which is present over here at my fingertip. Now some uh, historians, uh, some archaeologists will tell you that that is not Sargon, that is actually his grandson Naram Sin. I believe I wrote his name down in here. All right, so I want to share a couple of uh, reliefs here from this time. And uh, all of this has been preserved from about 5,000 years ago. And these are what are, are just uh, reliefs or carvings, if you will. Some people refer to them as stele. And let's see if I have a couple more here. And I'll here show you some of the carvings from 5,000 years ago. Here's another one here. All right, showing that period of time. And I always find that to be very, very interesting. And I tell you, while I'm on that subject, and let me shift over and show you a couple of other likenesses here before we go any further with Sargon. All of this is in ruins today, and but these are structures here that date back about 5,000 years ago. And uh, much of that was uh, destroyed during the first Persian Gulf War. And, and I'll tell you what that is at a later time, but not at this point. And let's see here. And there's some other likenesses in that period of time. And it's amazing to me that they have been preserved to this very day. And much of this was looted during the first Persian Gulf War. And here we have some others here. Such as that. Uh, you'll see this in your textbook. When you go through your textbook, the Sumerian uh, hair bonnet or hair, hair uh, whatever you want to call that, hair bonnet, this would be the best thing refer to that as. All right, so let's get back here to uh, Sargon, and I wrote the name here for you, Naram Sin, the grandson of Sargon, to stop anyway. And for Akkad, Akkad ruled over Sumer for 200 years. All right, so let's see here, and I want to mention to you some other things here about Sargon, and I told you earlier that he won 34 bottles, and uh, what they used, they uh, used these uh, Two wheeled chariots and these four wheeled cars. So there's more to follow on this in just a few minutes. All right, so I tried to uh, use my terrible, terrible uh, artistic skills here to design for you what these two wheeled chariots appeared as. Uh, you can see it right here. Notice see, uh, the wheels, the wheels were very, very crude. Uh, I'll show you what one of the wheels looked like. And I fashioned this myself, I just cut it out of uh, uh, wood. 
and you can see that it is it is round but it is uh, not really truly round notice where the uh, axle fits through which is right here and this was just two or three slabs of wood and wood was just uh, uh, then pinned together all right and you see what I tried to do right there so you can imagine when it would roll it doesn't roll very well such as that all right so anyway that's a, a type of a, a war weapon that they used at that time these two wheel chariots now the rider would be up in the top such as this now watch the, uh, the rails these are the rails that go out to the animal that's going to pull the chariot and this animal is an onager by the way, if you don't know what an onager is, that's a, a wild donkey. Uh, so you can imagine it's going into combat. You know, you've got this uh, wobbly type wheel, uh, two wheel chariot here, and pulled by a donkey. So it is not going to be pulled very, very fast whatsoever with that. They also made use of the four wheel cart. So imagine the same type of wheels here, pulled by an onager, and this would be the uh, driver right here and behind that this is a fighting man uh, use your imagination here the fighting man is in the cart and the fighting man has a javelin the fighting man has a spear which he'll use in battle so it's a uh, it's better than being infantry and being on foot but it's not a whole lot better than that all right so uh, we go here folks so Sumer was very strongly influenced by climate, also influenced by geography. Uh, my friends, this is some of the hottest areas on planet Earth. Uh, the temperatures during the daytime uh, can get to as high as 125 degrees. It is uh, It just literally, literally burns your flesh. There's not much humidity there. Uh, I've not been to Iran or been to Iraq, and I don't really want to go to those two places. They're kind of dangerous places. Uh, but anyway, I've not been there, but I've been close to it. I've been to Jordan. I've been to Israel. So I've experienced the intense heat at 125 degrees. And it is certainly, it's not pleasant. You, you, you try to stay in the shade as best as you can with that. Okay. And uh, geography is another thing, you know, that uh, extremely, extremely influences this area. Uh, it has an annual rainfall of about eight inches. And for eight months out of the year, there's no rain whatsoever. So nothing grows there. Nothing grows except if it is on the Fertile Crescent. Now, on the Fertile Crescent, which is that area around the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, it, it, it is fresh water there, and, and it provides a, a, a manner in which you can actually irrigate your crops. But that's where life is in those areas, is primarily right there on the Fertile Crescent itself, which I told you they had all the way from the Fertile uh, from for, uh, all the way from the Persian Gulf around to where uh, uh, where Israel is today, down where the uh, uh, Dead Sea is located. In this area, there's an absence of stone, or I should say, a scarcity, a scarcity of stone, minerals, and trees. So it's uh, those are in very very uh, limited supply there, and particularly when you get into the desert areas itself. All right, so uh, shall we move right along? Some of the uh, Oh, and by the way, for these ancient Sumerians, they had their own separate language. It's not a language, to my knowledge anyway, that we have available for today. So let's see about some of the other developments that the uh, Sumerians provided to Western civilization. You'll need to note these, by the way. Wheel transport, I already told you about that. So that's what we say. We say that the development of the wheel can be fixed or applied here to the, uh, the ancient Sumerians. They're, they're the ones that did this. Uh, you know, we have many, many theories on this. How did the first wheel get developed here? Some people say it was a potter's wheel, you know, in making pottery, and it just rolled from the pedestal and then uh, rolled away, and somebody said, uh, a light bulb went off and said, you know, uh, that's a manner in which we can have transportation. All right, now for the Sumerians, they also developed a calendar. You remember from the previous lecture, I told you about we had to develop these calendars, and what they did, they developed this lunar calendar. So if we look at the name there, lunar and lunar calendar, then this means that it's associated with the moon. All right, so all right, so let's move on with this. Move on to a different slide here. And for the Sumerians, the Sumerians were very well aware that the moon makes its circuit every 29 and a half days. All right, you can refer to that. The moon makes its circuit every 29 and a half days. It is a month. It is a month. All right, you see where the name month comes from. And so they devised this calendar, and this calendar was made up of six months of 29 days and six months 
of 30 days. Six months, 29 days, six months of 30 days. So if we were in class, I would have you to get out your stubby little pencil and do a quick calculation here. And how many days are in a lunar calendar year? And if you multiply 6 times 29 and add that to 6 times 30, you'll come up with 50, 354 days. So you can see that it is 11 days short each year. 11 days short each year. Of course, I've always wondered, and I tell my class this, why didn't they just develop a calendar that would have 12 months of 30 days? It would be more accurate than the one that they have here. But I don't know. I'm not an ancient Sumerian, so I really don't know about that. So what you got to do to compensate for that is every three months you have to add a month. Every three months you have to add, every three years you have to add a month. All right, so anyway, that's another contribution. Now, I think, personally, the greatest contribution, well, other than the will, the greatest contribution of the Sumerians is that of the development of writing. And they are the ones that did this. And they developed a type of writing which is called cuneiform. Some people refer to it as cuneiform. Cuneiform or cuneiform. Now, if you translate this, the Latin word cuneus means wedge. It means wedge. So try to follow along with me on this, on how we're going to do this writing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take clay, and clay dirt is actually what it is, and put this dirt in a, say, square frame. And we'll say the square frame, as you can't see my other hand, is something to this size right here. And I'll have this to be, this mud, this dirt, to be maybe uh, two to three inches thick, such as what you're seeing right there. And then I'm going to moisten that dirt so it creates mud. It creates clay, mud, if you will. Then I can take a reed, and this reed may come from a, uh, a papyrus plant, something like that. I'm going to take a reed, and then I'm going to press down into that clay and make these little wedge-shaped symbols. All right, follow me now. So I make these wedge-shaped symbols. Now, in cuneiform, there's no alphabet, but there was about 500 characters, about 500 shaped, 500 characters. And so people that are good with this can actually read those characters just like you're able to read words, read letters, and read words, you know, that's on a page in front of you, folks. All right, so you make the wedge into this moist clay, and then take the clay and put it out into the sun and allow it to bake. And so when it does, it creates this hardened clay. If you remove the mold, then you have this clay tablet, this clay tablet that is right there in front of you. But you got to remember here now, this is probably 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches wide, about 2 to 3 inches thick. And that's what you're carrying around as literally your page of paper. All right, so it's very, very cumbersome. But it is a way in which you can record writing. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more in just a second, it's also the topic of one of your uh, videos, your included videos, is that of the legend of Gilgamesh. It's a neat, neat story about Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh was written in cuneiform. The epic of Gilgamesh was written in cuneiform. All right, so anyway, I, I want you to recognize that. That is a type of writing. And as we move further with this, we'll go into different civilizations. And these different civilizations will have their own unique style of writing. Here's some examples here of cuneiform. I cannot read a single thing, not a single thing. But I have watched people, watched them on TV documentaries, read cuneiform. And these are people that are experts in that. And they read it just like reading Braille or just like reading, you know, a page out of your textbook. You know, so they're very, very good with that. All right, so when I ask you in the future, what is the type of writing that the ancient uh, Sumerians developed? It is cuneiform. All right, you can catch up on your notes there, folks. There are 500 characters, no alphabet. And for most of the cuneiform records that have been preserved, these are administrative records. We have a few of them that are for Proverbs, a uh, few of them are, that are Proverbs and Proverbs, uh, hymns, and also tales such as the Ethnic of Gilgamesh. All right, some other developments. For the Sumerians, they developed the bronze plow bronze plow. All right, that means you have to have bronze, obviously, for the plowshare. All right, they also developed for sailboat. And most people don't realize this. You know, they, they think about these areas, you know, like uh, uh, Jordan or Iran or Iraq being very, very bad. Asia, for example, being very backward areas. And I promise you, folks, they are not backward at all. They are just as uh, modernized as America, which I think when you 
tumbleweeds in America is far from being the most modernistic uh, uh, country in the world. You don't believe me? You go to China. You go to the People's Republic of China, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But one of the amazing things, if you go into that area around the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea area, is the, just the uh, sailing abilities of these individuals. We don't even think about that. You know, we think about, wow, this is just desert, and uh, these people have no concept, you know, of sailboats and that's, and uh, or, or watercraft in general. But they are very, very good sailors, very capable. If you go to Egypt today, if you're traveling on the Nile River, you'll find all of these sailboats, these felucas is what they're known as, and uh, just everywhere. It's, I mean, if you think Smith Lake, you know, is, uh, has a watercraft on it during a popular times of the year, you know, warm weather times of the year, you don't know what you're talking about when you match that up to some of these areas here, uh, of the Tigris, Euphrates River, the Nile River. Anyway, okay, so anyway, uh, gosh, I, maybe this is probably the best, the best development of the ancient Sumerians. They developed brewed beverages. They developed beer. They developed beer. And I just happen to have something here in front of me here. I'm not advocating that you uh, partake with that, but anyway, they developed beer. That should be probably listed as their greatest development. I say that uh, facetiously. And the type of beer that they had was a honey beer. Now, honey beer today, we often refer to it as mead. Uh, you may or may not like it. It doesn't really matter to me one way or the other. All right, so it's a honey beer. So I want to tell you a story here. And this comes from 4,000 years ago in ancient Babylon, in the times that we've been talking about. And the way the legend goes is that when a young lady got married, married to her husband, is that the father of the bride, for one month, would always provide the young groom with mead, honey beer, if you will, mead, honey beer. I don't know why he did that for 12, uh, 12 excuse me, for 30 days out of the month. I don't know why he did it. Maybe to keep him from running away. I don't know what the case is. But if we play upon that good story here, what can we refer to that as? The honey beer for a month, or in other words, the honeymoon. Get it? Get it? All right, and I'm sure you do. Now, for these ancient Sumerians, they worshipped and are worshipped the gods in these terrace step towers. These terrace step towers. What they refer to as is ziggurats. They're called ziggurats. Let me see if I can find a couple of photographs in the textbook of these ziggurats. And I want you to recognize that word. Terrace step towers. This is what they look like here. This is the white temple of uh, uh, Uruk. White Temple of Ura. You can imagine this 5,000 years of weathering away that uh, most of these are not preserved very, very well uh, whatsoever. But in talking to uh, service people, service uh, people have actually served over in uh, Iraq, uh, they tell me, yeah, you, you can still see them. And, you know, for the desert there, the desert is just literally flat as can be. So when you see these uh, ziggurats, you know, it's, uh, it's not difficult to recognize them because they, they certainly stand out. All right, let's see if I can find another likeness here. And here's a ziggurat there. A ziggurat at Ur. And by the way, they were the royal tombs of Ur. And I've provided a couple of good videos for you folks, and I hope you'll watch the videos. Uh, if you look here, you can see this uh, uh, Sumerian headdress, a Sumerian element here, bronze element, Sumerian headdress. That's a photograph I showed you just a few minutes ago. All right, so uh, all, all very interesting with that. All right, now, for this civilization of Sumer, it is going to decline, uh, primarily because of the enemies that are present there at that time. But another reason that it's going to decline is through a process which is called salinization. All right, now, I want you to think about this for a second. Salinization, uh, saline, salt. So we get an accumulation of salt. And accumulation of salt, and this is going to be in the agricultural land where you grow uh, uh, grow crops. All right, so a little bit difficult to understand. Try to track with me on this. Now, I've already told you that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, both of those rivers are freshwater rivers. But when you get to the Persian Gulf, the Persian Gulf is salt water. So this means that that area that is between the freshwater and the salt water has trace amounts of salt in it. It's a saline. It's partly saline. So over hundreds and hundreds of years, as you irrigate your fields, and then the sun leads to evaporation of the water that's present there, that leaves accumulations, it's your small accumulations, of salt within the soil. 
But after generations and generations of that, that salt accumulates to such a degree that crops will no longer grow there. So what that forces you to do, if you're in civilization, that forces you to do, you have to leave that area and you have to move northward. You go further to the north, further to the north. Okay, so you kind of get the idea about that. All right, so Sumer is going to pass away, die away. All right, so that's going to lead us to another civilization. And let's refer to this civilization as the Old Babylonians, the Old Babylonian era. And I really don't even like to use that word, Old Babylonian. And it's going to exist, by the way, from about 2000 BCE to about 1600 BCE. It will differ from the Sumerian civilization, number one, by geography, because it's further to the north, further to the north, and also by language, by language. Remember, the ancient Sumerians had their own separate language. And like I said, I don't even know if anybody even speaks that language today. I'm, I'm sure they do not. And the civilization, like I said, will move further to the north with its capital city of Babylon. Now, we will talk quite a bit about Babylon in the next several lectures here. Babylon will exist for a period of time. It'll be destroyed. It'll come back, be destroyed. It'll come back, and so forth. And the other thing we had here were the differences in the type of language. And for the old Babylonians, which are also known as Amorites, and I guess technically speaking, that is the more correct terminology here for the Amorites, but I, I don't use that word, and I always use just the old Babylonians. It's a little bit more comfortable and understanding this, I think, anyway. Okay, but the Semitic language is a language today that is spoken by Arabs, is spoken by Hebrews, spoken by Ethiopians, all similar languages, all similar languages with that. Now I'm going to give you another type of uh, language in just a little bit here. All right, for the Amorites, they're called the Old Babylonians, and the best-known individual of the Old Babylonians is that of Hammurabi. All right. Put a little uh, asterisk by that. I want you to recognize Hammurabi. Hammurabi had served as the king of the old Babylonians of the Amorites from 1792 until 1750 BCE. Conquered all of Mesopotamia. All of Mesopotamia. Known by several titles, he was called the king of Akkad and Sumer. King of Akkad and Sumer. Uh, also recognized as the king of the four quarters of the world. All right. And the best known, I guess, is probably the King of Justice. The King of Justice. All right, now, what Hammurabi is responsible for is developing the Code of Hammurabi. The Code of Hammurabi. All right, now, I'm going to shift over to your textbook, a couple of pages here, and I'll show you a, a photograph of the the uh, uh, eight-foot stone column, if you will, which is formed of basalt. Basalt is a type of stone, and on this there are 282 laws. Now, here is a photograph that shows you, this is the actual uh, basalt column, eight foot tall. Uh, this is located in the Louvre Museum, which is found in Paris, France. Uh, you, look, uh, you see the date that I took this photograph, as a matter of fact, but that's what it looks like. If you look on the back side or look down and hit this area, in cuneiform, you'll find 282 laws that are inscribed there. And let's see here. Uh, here's a photograph that's in your textbook on page 21. And showing you the same thing. This is the uh, photograph I showed you a second ago. And at the very top of it, you can see right here at the top. And this is what you see at the top. And this is showing you Hammurabi. And Hammurabi, who is right here where my pencil point is. And the, uh, uh, the goddess of justice, Shamash. Shamash is present right over here. Okay, now in the code of Hammurabi, and I want you to recognize that code because uh, we closely associate that with Hammurabi. There are 282 laws. And my friends, this is the first example here, first example of uh, written jurisprudence. It's like a law book, and it covers things like what you can do, and what you can't do. And if you commit a crime, a perpetrated, perpetrated crime, the punishment that can be inflicted upon you. Now, it is not a fair system. Because people were organized into those that were of wealth in the upper class, which are considered to be men and others and others. These are the people that are not high in society here. And crimes of men against others were punishable in different ways. Like if we have a man and a man robs another man, a wealthy man robs another wealthy man, then the punishments there may not be very, ser may be very serious. 
But if a crime is committed of a man against a uh, uh, an other, then there may be no punishment whatsoever. Crimes of a man against a slave, there's no punishment for it whatsoever other than if the slave was owned by another man. All right, now there are two basic principles to this, and you've heard of both of these before, an eye for an eye, and also the other one, let the buyer beware. Now let's take this first one here, an eye for an eye. So if you're a man and you knock out the eye, puncture the eye of another man, what happens? Well, you lose your eye. But if you're a man and you puncture the eye of an other, what happens to you? Maybe you're fined 20 shekels, such as that. All right, kind of get the idea. It is not a fair system of jurisprudence. And you can read further on that if you wish to do so. The other principle here, let the buyer beware. Let the buyer beware. Caveat emptor. You know, in other words, the buyer should be aware of uh, buying goods that are not very, very worthy there, too. All right, now, I mentioned this to you earlier about the Epic of, Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh was an ancient, ancient king. May have been Sargon. I don't really know about that. We're talking 5,000 years ago. And I provided for you folks a, uh, a video uh, for you to uh, be amused with, with this and also with the Code of Hammurabi. And I hope that you will watch those. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay, some of the old Babylonian contributions to Western civilization. We had mathematics, and they were very good with this. Now, don't forget now, we're talking about 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago. So I want you to imagine this in 5,000 years ago, uh, being able to multiply, being able to divide. Some of us have problems doing that anyway. Uh, square roots, cube groups, reciprocals, exponential functions. That even makes my head hurt. Alrighty, let's move on to a couple of other kind of minor societies, and really in some ways some of these aren't minor, but we had another group that would enter into the area of Mesopotamia, and this group was referred to as the Cassids. The Cassids. Now, they came from the central areas of Asia, from the area of the steppes. Now, I want you to imagine this and match this up to the ancient Sumerians. Remember the ancient Sumerians had these solid wheels on their chariots, the chariots were pulled by onagers, these uh, wild, or I should say by this time would be tamed donkeys, if you will. And when the cassettes arrived, the cassettes had chariots that had spoke wheels, and they were pulled, driven, if you will, by horses. So match that up, match that up, and you can see who is going to come out as a dominant power, and that will be the cassettes. We had another group that came in, which were called the Hittites, the Hittites, very, very warlike group. But they got along fairly well with the Cassites. Now, when the Hittites came through, the Hittites destroyed Babylon. Babylon will be rebuilt. And the Hittites occupied the area of Anatolia. Now, Anatolia is where Turkey is located today. Like I said, very, very warlike individuals, always fighting with the Egyptians. And the next lecture will be on the Egyptians here. But uh, always, always warring with them. That is until a Hittite uh, chieftain actually married a, uh, uh, an Egyptian princess, and it brought an end to the fighting here. All right. And we also had another society there that was called the Matanians. I don't think I even wrote that down for you. I'm going to move over your textbook to page uh, 48 in your textbook. Let me try to show you where these groups were located here. Uh, anyway, you can see. Let's see if I can get this properly positioned for you folks. All right, here is Mesopotamia, which is present here. And where the Kassites occupied was this area through here. All right, and where the uh, the Matanians were located was up in this area, about, about where Syria is located today. And I don't know if you can read this. And the Hittites, the very warlike Hittites, were up in uh, Anatolia. Anatolia is where Turkey is present today. All right, so a couple of minor groups there. Now, they differ from the other societies. Let's get this out of the way here. They differed from these other societies in the type of language that they had. Uh, they spoke an Indo-European language. You can see how to spell that Indo-European language. That is as opposed to a Semitic type language. And with this Indo-European language, this, uh, today it is a type, a similar language that is spoken by Hindus, Persian. Many people think that Persian and Arabic are similar languages, and they are not. Uh, it's also Greek. Latin is an Indo-European language, uh, Romance languages, Slavic, German. So Indo-European languages are, are, are more similar to English. All right, now, 
for the Hittite civilization, the Hittite civilization is going to virtually disappear. And it should, it'll be covered over in sand. This is up in where Turkey is located today. And it would not be really discovered until 1907 when a huge archaeological dig was uh, was conducted there in the city of Hattasus. It translates to mean Hittite city. Hittite city was uncovered. And lo and behold, within that city, there were 20,000 cuneiform tablets that were found there. So anyway, so they uncovered that hidden city. All right, folks, that's going to be the end of that section there, which will deal with ancient Sumeria, the old Babylonians, a uh, short, short uh, a brief, if you will, on the uh, Cassites, the Hittites. And when we return for our next lecture, lecture number three, we'll be going into the Egyptian civilization. And I'll probably show this to you again. And I don't require you to know this. In, in this course, I don't require you to know dates at all. And, but we'll find that Egyptian civilization is organized into what you can see in front of you, all of those various periods. Now, I don't hold students responsible for the dates. I've memorized those dates on many, many occasions. And every time a new edition of the textbook comes out, they change those dates, you know, by 100 years, 200 years. And so finally, I just said, to heck with that. It's not even important to me. But roughly speaking, and this is what we'll talk about the next time we get together, because we're going to spend about a lecture and a half with the Egyptians. But the archaic period will last from about 3100 BCE to 2715 BCE. The old kingdom will follow that. 2715 BCE to 2170 BCE, followed by the first inter first intermediate period, 2170 to 1983 BCE. Anytime we go into an intermediate period, there's always, always problems in Egypt. This will be followed by the second, or excuse me, by the Middle Kingdom, 1983, 1745 BCE, which would, and that's a good period of time for Egyptian history. This will be followed by the second intermediate period, 1975, 1550 BCE. Uh, problems, problems, problems in Egypt, which will be followed by the New Kingdom, and Egypt will become very, very warlike during this period of time, which will be followed by the third intermediate period, and that's just going to be virtually the demise of Egypt for that period of time. And then finally into the late period, which in conditions are not going to improve for Egypt at that time. All right, so anyway, that's what's uh, in store for us for the next time we get together. Egypt is always a fun topic to uh, go into and delve with, and a lot of visuals to show you there with Egypt. And so anyway, okay, folks, uh, stay up with your material. You've got a quiz to take here. You know, you got videos to watch here. And so I appreciate this period of time. All right, thank you very much.